show. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our second special dual taping of I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. And the Here We Are podcast, a science podcast hosted by me, comedian Shane Moss. So uh, in a moment, we're going to introduce each other a little bit more, but uh, this podcast casts coincide with the launch of my new book, Stick to Business, which launched yesterday Ooh. on Amazon. I'm saying this before the fact, yeah, but yesterday, and you can find out about it on my website, petermcgraw.org, and buy it as a softback ebook or audiobook. And I'm also speaking, uh, recording in the past, um, but imagining you <laughs> listening to this one day after. So as you know, this book has kind of set the world on fire. <laughs> New York Times bestseller. Thanks so much for all the reviews. Thanks for telling all of your friends demanding a sequel to it we're working on it now i mean <laughs> I, I, the the results have, have been uh so incredible that it worked it did one it day I've, I've have agents publishers calling me <laughs> so for those of you uh who are i'm not joking listeners who don't know who shane is first of all you should go back and listen to yesterday's episode mm -hmm. but shane is as he said a stand-up comedian and he specializes in science. Mm. And, and we've been friends for nearly 10 years. He has two touring shows presently. One is called Stand Up Science, which is half comedy and half science show. And the second one is called Head Talks, which is a special psychedelic version of Stand Up Science. Speaking of psychedelics, you can see him in the documentary film Psychonautics. He's, of course, the host of Here We Are. Mm -hmm. Here We Are listeners know this. And... Most importantly, Shane is a special contributor to Shtick to Business. He is essentially the comic relief and the person who goes, ah, Pete's about 90% right. Yeah. I Well, and, and then I have a lot of uh, anecdotes of, uh, be, because so much of your book is like, these are, these are business lessons from the world of comedy. And many of my anecdotes are, are also like, almost the reverse of it too of like oh yeah now that you presented this business lesson here's how i've actually used it and then um and then there's even sections where where i learned something new about business that i wasn't as a comedian using that i'm like oh i could actually use that with comedy so it's a little bit of i'm i'm adding that extra element of having to go back the other way too here and there yeah they're fun they're they're these little like you know sort of 500 700 word sections called stick by shane mm -hmm. i'm just imagining someone now like there's someone out there that's going to be counting the words that's like you said five to <laughs> seven hundred words some of them are 350 some of them are a thousand it's all over the place you know i would just say this at least you're using numbers <laughs> um and so for here we are listeners uh peter mcgraw is a Good friend of mine who's now been on the podcast for now. This is the fourth time uh, with this being a, a second part. He's my probably second oldest scientist friend in, in terms of length of time and also age. Um, wait, who's your uh, oldest? Is it Marty? Uh, uh, yeah, Marty. Right, right around the same time. Okay. Oh, no, wait. I met you first. And then Marty. You were there when I met Marty. Yeah, you're the oldest. You I'll, win. I'll take it. Um, and... Peter's a business professor who uh, got into studying humor research. That's how we ended up meeting uh, at the exact same time, almost, that I was kind of getting into doing, putting science into my comedy. And so it would have been an unjust world if we never met. I wonder, yeah, it's interesting thinking of the counterfactual. Mm -hmm. if we had, so we met at the Bridgetown Comedy Festival nine plus years ago, how we would have when we might have crossed paths otherwise. Like four years later or something like that. Now we're both like a little more established. Maybe we would have hated each other. That's funny. <laughs> if this guy thinks he's some scientist, this guy thinks he's some humor researcher. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've been, we've been great friends. 
Peter gives me lots of fa- one. He's an easy laugh. Love that. As a comedian, he's a great audience member. And then, uh, and then two, he is everything that I'm not. He, he is uh, all, all of the business, all of the professional stuff that I especially uh, I used to be ridiculously bad at and have started to move into like oh kind of getting into i I sort of know how to do some of this business and marketing stuff much of that is the influence from doing my podcast but also much of this is is directly related to a lot of great conversations and personal advice that that pete's given me so so he also knows a lot of my career and my path and he's always when i'm thinking about doing something and asking him for advice, he always breaks it down into these business terms that help me. Mm. I don't know why that's like so helpful to it, you know. To uh, it's one thing when a friend gives you advice, but for me, it's another thing when there's like, well, there's this study that shows. Yes. It's like it validates the same information that anyone else might possibly give you, but it it just like makes it resonate a little bit more. Like, okay, well, this is actually a well studied thing. This is a common problem that's out there, and there's common solutions oftentimes. Right, right. And so I I put some posts out on social media asking for like business questions that maybe we would answer, and kind of what we ended up. Deciding deciding on doing is I kind of got a sense of what some people are looking for and some of the feedback. I think Pete has some specific ones. And I was like, well, why not break down? I have a zillion business questions. And, and then I also thought maybe talking about my path for, for listeners that don't kind of don't know how I got where I am today, which is most of you, I don't share this stuff much. And and then you'll get to hear like some of the advice that Pete's given me along the way, some of which is relevant to the book, Stick to Business. And then maybe some of the modern things, my career is always in flux. As mm. you know, I always have a zillion new projects that I'm picking between which one and one thing's working, one thing's not working. Why is that? Should I put more energy into this, more money into that? And uh, and you're one of my favorite people to go through these things with. So I, I, think, I think the reason why this will be really uh, grab people more and be a bit more accessible is even though I'm sure almost no one out there is a comedian themselves uh, is, is it'll be a good example of what the book is we'll go through my life as a comedian and then I think people will hear things that will re- really resonate for them for their small businesses they're trying to get promotions they're mm-hmm. trying to you know being unhappy with certain aspects of their career looking to expand looking to get into something else looking to turn their hobby into a serious mm-hmm. business these are all the sorts of things that I've been through in my own life yeah it's great so in the acknowledgments of the book, mm-hmm. I say I like to give advice and I like to take advice. Mm-hmm. And so the the book, of course, gives a lot of advice. But to get there, I needed to take a lot mm-hmm. of advice. And so maybe maybe at some point we'll turn this around and you can give me some. Yeah, but happy to. Yeah. Once in a while, I give old Pete some no, advice. No, 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 yeah. absolutely. Well, and and you know the thing about Shane is. I'm rooting for him. <laughs> like <laughs> more than I am, I, probably. There are times where <laughs> I feel that way. Most people root for me more than I root for myself. I, I really am just like, oh, he, I, I think he can do it. I think he can pull this off. And for those of you who are um, contemplating the sort of making a change to your professional life, mm. I hope that this conversation, and I hope, I hope if you read the book, thinking about comedians is is kind of inspirational to you because one of the cool things about inspir- about comedians are boy they're pursuing their dreams mm-hmm. you know what i mean they're they're at least, at least the ones who are hustling for yeah they're these are dreamers you know to think like oh i can do that and you know? i i mean i i hope i think that in, in reading the book there was also lessons that you know, they they aren't mentioned outright in this way, but many of these same things could be applied to dating, yes. to exercising, yes. to yes. wellness, to to being a more resilient person, to managing stress, to managing pandemics that all of a sudden <laughs> like happen and throw everything out of whack. Just yeah. uh, these black swans that happen, if you will, in life. And uh, and and so so I just I hope as people are listening and then uh, hopefully getting the book as well. 
Uh, they're also thinking like, how can I actually use some of yes. these things to just also, you know, you can improve relationships and everything else. Yeah, I think that's great. So, so one thing I want to say before we start is in the same way that, so Shane and I have been friends for nearly 10 years, I think making profound change in your life takes time. Mm-hmm. You know, it in the movies, it needs to get done in two hours. Yeah. But in life, like five years is fast. Yeah. And so... um I would just say keep that in mind in terms of um, as as a listener, if you're thinking about making a profound change in your life, that uh, it's it's likely to be the culmination of a lot of work, some risk taking, and you won't actually really have an answer right away. But even knowing that, I feel like helps you move forward a lot easier. I I remember one of the best things when I, uh, not to like bounce around because I kind of want to go back to the origin story a little bit, but one of the big things that changed my work ethic early on when I was getting into science and I was like, well, this is just this never ending amount of stuff. Like, how do I pick what to articulate? Who uh, imposter syndrome? Who am I to, you know, I didn't go to college, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What I just would tell myself when I was reading a book and thinking like, I'd rather watch TV or something instead. I would often tell myself, just keep doing this. And five years from now, you're going to be a much smarter person. Absolutely. And because of that, you'll think of all of these solutions that you don't have a sense of right now. Mm-hmm. You know? So my personal story about this was, and it's, it's in the book, so I have a chapter about writing and about the value of writing. And I realized as an assistant professor that my writing was bad. Mm-hmm. And, um, and academic papers are the currency of academia. And so... I did a bunch of research to figure out how to become a better writer. I studied the habits of the world's greatest writers, and then I just started doing that. Mm -hmm. And at first, it was horrible. It was just a terrible, awful experience. And it probably took three years before I even started to like to write. Mm -hmm. And now... I love to write, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's 10 plus years later. It's ironic because when I started reading science publications, I was like, this is awful. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is a nightmare. Yes. But if I keep going, I'll get better at it. I'll realize what's important to actually read. <laughs> yes. And how to scan a little bit and how to interpret and when to let some of this stuff go and blah, blah, blah. I'll give you a quick example of this. So when I started, when I showed up at my PhD program, so this is, this is August 1997, my advisor, I sat down with her, my advisor, Barb Mellers, gave me a paper that she had, it was forthcoming, so it had already been accepted for publication, but it hadn't been published yet. And she said, um, read this and we'll discuss it tomorrow. And so I was like, okay. So I, I went back to where I was staying and I read the paper. It took me four hours mm-hmm. to write, to read the paper. Mm-hmm. I took five pages of notes reading this paper, and then I, I went in the next day and you know and told her how much I liked it and what I liked and what I didn't and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, if someone had given me that exact paper, it would have taken me 20 minutes to read. Right, 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 right. And I would have had a much better understanding of it all. Yeah, right, so right. I, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so the goal of this of this podcast is just to have a kind of uh, clearly a free th- free-flowing conversation. Yeah. Um, where we're going to try to apply some of the ideas, some of the lessons from Stick to Business. And, and if you don't know what this is, basically it's, it's not about being funny. This is a book about thinking funny, thinking differently, taking a kind of creative, innovative approach to building a business or developing a career. And all, all the ideas in the book are from the world's funniest people like Shane Moss, that they have these practices and perspectives that underlie this incredibly difficult task of creating laughs on command. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, to start out with my origin story, I, I, I don't want to uh, get, this is the kind of stuff that you got to answer in like every newspaper article, like, when did you decide you wanted to be a comedian or whatever, but I might as well do a, sure. a, a very quick version of that. And I, I actually think that there might be some interesting lessons from it. So when I was nine or 10 years old I, uh, and everyone was trying to decide what they wanted to do for a career, it's like, oh, should I be a doctor? Should I be a fireman? Should I be a construction worker like my dad? What, you know? And, uh, and nothing sounded appealing to me. I was playing video games one day with a friend and he was like, you should be a stand-up comedian. And I was like... I don't. I I was like, "What's that?" He's like, "It's someone that stands on stage and makes them laugh." And I was like, "Yeah, 
That's what I'm. Who doesn't yeah, want to do that? Yeah, and then uh, so I decided I was going to be a stand-up comedian before I'd ever even seen stand-up comedy. Do you remember this friend's name? Uh, yeah, Eric Schmuck. Eric, um, thank you. Yeah, who's now a scientist actually and studies DNA and stuff. And he, so um, uh, I, I didn't tell anyone. I, a small Midwestern town, practical folk, uh, you know, would have been dismissed as this ridiculous dream, um, and. And uh, plus the nightmare of like everyone then wanting to tell you a joke and like, oh, you think you're funny? Prove it sort of crap that sure. every comedian has to deal with. But I started writing, you know, I, I started just consuming as much stand up as I possibly could. I recorded, you know, every David Letterman show. Mm. And would, uh, if there's a stand up comedian on, I'd fast forward to that. I watched the sets multiple times. I didn't care if it was good or bad or whatever. And when Comedy Central hit, that was like 13, 14 at the time when Comedy Central came out. And that's when there was like regular stand up comedy half hour specials, hour specials. On. I watched those. I watched every single stand-up that that I could all of the time. It was like one, almost all that I did um, when I wasn't being yelled at for not doing homework <laughs> and stuff like that. And I was I was dedicated to doing. It's part of why I didn't pay any attention in school because I was like, "What's that have to do with the career that I'm going to have?" Yeah, and it's a logical choice. Yeah, and um, and and so. Uh, it, you know, I like to tell people when I was diagnosed with ADD or whatever is like, well, there's a difference between like focusing on your internal world and I'm running all these mental stimulation, uh, simulations and mental rehearsals for later on in life and planning out my life. Like I was pretty focused on that. Sure. I had that school distract me from time to time. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, focus can mean different things, especially when it comes to the world of creativity. Yes. And, uh, where, can, can I interrupt for a second? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, first of all, I've never heard this story before. Mm -hmm. For as much time as we spent together, mm -hmm. I never knew this mm -hmm. video games, you should be a stand-up story. I've heard other stories, but not this one. Mm -hmm. So, I'm enjoying it. One of the things that I think is, is great about comics as inspiration is they are outsiders almost from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but, but a typical origin story is the class clown, the kid in the back of the room the one who doesn't exactly play by the rules doesn't doesn't excel in an organized you know school factory whatever environment and um and we sort of lament these people at least teachers do and parents do and so on and yet it's those kinds of behaviors and thoughts and approaches to the world that are highly valued in business mm -hmm. especially starting a business because Starting a business is typically about breaking rules and about seeing the world differently. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you look at like some of the world's greatest initial startups, they, they came almost from a comedic standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and you, I mean, you don't have that much choice when, when you're, you, you know, when you're Coca-Cola or whatever, you don't have to take that many chances because you're Coca-Cola, but when you're starting from, from nothing and you don't have the resources to have a Super Bowl ad, yes. <laughs> like whatever else, you're going to have to be creative in one way or another. Yes, exactly. Uh, um, and, and, and so, and I also, uh, I also think that, uh, you know, an important part of what I did was I watched all the stand up. I, I liked watching the stuff that I didn't find funny as well. I found that to be just as valuable because I really thought mm -hmm. of myself as a student. I would watch specials that I didn't think was funny at all multiple times, figure out what I didn't like about them, what I didn't want to be as a comedian. And then it was around this time that I started writing some jokes and like, you know, I'd say something funny in a conversation. I'd sneak off and kind of make a note of it. And, and, uh, you know, it, it started amassing, um, uh, uh, notebooks filled with joke ideas and the plan was to to uh and there's definitely a lesson in here the plan was like okay as soon as i'm free as soon as i'm out of high school i'm gonna move to a big city or whatever new york or la i'm gonna start this stand-up comedy dream and then when as it approached i just got very anxious i i was like i realized like oh my god that's scary and then and then there's stories that i could tell myself of like well, I should save up some money first. You mm -hmm. know, New York City's going to be expensive. I, I should make sure and save money. And then I ended up uh, just like 
working in a factory and not saving money, drinking most of it away and miserable and then telling myself some story like, okay, next year's the year, next year's the year. And five years went by and I remember my 23rd birthday when I was like, I haven't done any of the things that my whole life, you know, at the time, 23 is young, but when you're 23, uh, you know, uh, that's five years is a big chunk of your life. And, and I remember just being like, you know, I'm miserable. I'm in this horrible factory job just to get by. And, and I am not doing any of these things that I thought I was going to. And I was just like something clicked in my head. And I was like, I don't care about if I have money saved or whatever. I'll scramble together whatever I can. I'm just going. And then I moved with a friend who happened to be going to Boston. And, uh, and, and so that was also less intimidating to have someone to split rent with and everything. So went to Boston. And then I had, turns out, I had no idea how to become a stand-up comedian. <laughs> okay. Like, I didn't know what the process was. You could you could have done Letterman, because you know what that's like. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I started literally looking in the yellow pages, which were still a thing at the time, like, under comedy club, and then, like, calling comedy clubs and being like, yeah, I want to be a stand-up comedian. That's amazing. Like, how do I do that? That's amazing. Some um, uh, uh, Rick Jenkins with the comedy studio actually was like kind enough to be like, well, I have this whole packet that I've made for people that are looking to give it a try rather than because he had more of a showcase. Like, I like giving new people a shot, but you should still know some basics before you start. Mm-hmm. And so he had kind of this this information all set and ready for people. Like, here's some, here's some things you can do. Here's things you need to know about, like, what the process is, finding an open mic, and maybe taking a comedy class, using a microphone, all this stuff. And then... Um, and then finally, I, I went through all that. I went to, you know, there's like a couple free tickets to some shows included in that information. So he's like, why don't you come and watch a couple shows first, see how it goes. And then I went, I started. First set was like, eh. I I have no, it wasn't good. I have no, I know I got laughs. I don't. I don't recall what my material was. That's I don't too bad. I don't remember if the if the stuff was like getting a laugh because people were being nice cuz they knew it was my first time on stage. Sure. But I I just the the only thing that I remember is I had this bit that I dreamed up like the night before and it was like I needed to read something about like medical side effects or something that I printed out off the internet and I went to grab it out of my pocket and it wasn't there. <laughs> and so I set this whole thing up and then I didn't have the thing to say and then I'm like scrambling to improvise. And then I took a comedy class after that. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Rick Jenkins was like, listen, you can't just like, this isn't an open mic. You know, there's paying customers here. You're going to need to like do something. You got to get better, it. son. Yeah. And then went took a comedy class, figured out how open mics uh, went, and that's when I started doing uh, the open mic scene. And so, so the open mic scene was like the test ground for for everything. And this is in the book. Yeah, you talk about a famous or infamous open mic the emerald isle is a bar that no longer exists is in dorchester massachusetts which is the most uh the worst city and this isn't like the worst part of the worst city in all of massachusetts high crime and everything else i got mugged at, at, at gunpoint once there and it was a true open mic meaning like most open mics you sign up and then there's a lottery and you might get picked that night mm-hmm. you might not uh, it's a hour and a half, two hour long show. This is like whoever signs up gets on. That means it's a six hour show. There's no actual audience there. It's all the the audience is all just comedians, comedians that are like also just catching up with themselves. Sure. And like this is where they meet up each week to like hang out, and it's also like you know it's kind of like more of a social club than anything. And then you get called up and you do your five minutes to a room full of comedians who aren't laughing. Thing. and that's when i that's when i learned how to like get the attention from comedians first say thing like comedians like saying all these taboo things so it's like well how how do i make comedians uncomfortable how do i say something that's like comedians would be like oh jesus i'd be nervous <laughs> saying that and that was that's when I started. I eventually went back and did a showcase. There's a graduation eight weeks later for this show. 
Um, I, the other different thing that I did is I did. F- I knew people weren't going to be listening anyway, so I did five new minutes every single week mm-hmm. to experiment and throw as much spaghetti against the wall as possible. Most people are doing the f- same five minutes, maybe rotating one joke in once every few months or whatever. And I I picked apart like the 20, 30 seconds that worked. Graduation show is back at the comedy studio. Two months later, I cobbled together the five minutes that I thought were the strongest out of those eight times that, mm-hmm. I, that I went to an open mic. And I killed it. Not not just the other people graduating, but there was also regular comics and and, and the regular comics there. Then we're like, hey, this uh, this guy's pretty good. We should get him spots at all the, all of the local clubs and mm-hmm. stuff. And then I was off and running um, from there. Yeah, that uh, so that's reminiscent of uh, of a little inter- exchange that we have in mm-hmm. in the book where I talk about the importance of um, the N word. Mm-hmm. networking yeah <laughs> and how people hate to network yeah and and so what i make a case and this is this is built off of um something i picked up from one of my guest speakers in my class this woman sarah zaslow about don't think of it as networking think of it as making business friends mm-hmm. and the the value of needing others in order to develop a career mm-hmm. and sometimes they may be close ties like you and me helping each other out but they can also be weak ties. That is someone that you know that you have a little bit of affection for, you know, that you're able to ask them a question, ask them for information, invite them to do something, and and the value of, of that. Um, and having to stretch yourself a little bit to do that. And and you say, when it comes to to the business of comedy, comics need other comics. Yeah. They need them to vouch for you, to to book you on their shows right that is to you know i'm hosting an open mic i'm gonna have you come you host an open mic and have me come Mm -hmm. to it they um maybe maybe someone starts a writer's room and says hey shane would be great for this and so on and so forth yeah i and because i think intuitively in say something like comedy and i'm sure this could be there's a lot of parallels in a lot of businesses the the clear trajectory is like well First, I first I um, you know get in in this open mic. Hopefully, then I get a showcase spot in a club. So I need that booker, that club owner, mm-hmm. to like me, the gatekeeper. Yeah, and, and then after that, I I I want to get a hosting spot at this other club. At the so then I move from the C to the B to the A club, and then after hosting, then I get into featuring. So what I really need is these good relationships with these bookers and like finding a way in there and then after that i need an agent and a manager and everything those things that i did get were almost all from comedians comedians going to the bookers that they are already in with like hey you should give this guy a shot comedians being like hey i know your showcase uh, is usually like a 10 person bringer show or whatever before you'll audition someone Mm -hmm. that slimy way to make money uh um, so that for for someone who doesn't know that that means if you're going to be performing you need to bring 10 bring audience 10 of your friends yes of course. yeah yeah so a classic comedy How, club you, model you know what i will tell you this so, so short-sighted it, it it's just i don't know anything quite like that yeah. in the world like you know or just, where it's just, yeah yeah you bring the customers too yes um and it shows you by the way it shows you how much competition there is yeah because they can do that that's right and so people being like hey this guy's really funny so much you know he's new here he just moved here he doesn't have 10 people to bring i vouch for him Mm -hmm. stuff like that up up until you know two years in so i started in 2004 2006 i got accepted into the boston comedy festival now that's another thing like okay maybe if i get a chance to like meet the booker of the boston comedy festival but that's all you know they're out and about and what comedians are saying is like the new hot people in town or whatever they're paying attention to that too more than they are paying attention to the the videos which can be misleading everyone can have a good set once in a while and have like a a good submission video um and so got into that and then from there i did really well i made it to the finals and the in this festival but it was again there a comic who i didn't know at the time but he just happened to be in the festival as well chel borg uh, chel bjorgen and and uh 
Minneapolis, who had just been in this Aspen uh, U.S. Comedy Arts Festival, the biggest at the time, the biggest fest- comedy festival. If you're a new person, this is like this is your big break to get into this. There's 20 people, 20 new comics a year. He had been in the year before, recommended me to the person that booked him. Uh, uh, that was like, hey, if you're at this festival and you see anyone good, let us know. Okay, that got me into this. HBO Aspen Comedy Arts Festival, and then an interesting thing happened, which was uh, which we can talk a little bit about. Which was, I I was in there um, with, uh, let's see, like T.J. Miller, Kyle Kinane, John Mulaney, like all of these people that are now way more successful than I am. <laughs> but this is in 2007, and these were these are all Eric Andre oh, yes. was there. Uh, so there's like these 20 people that that at least 10 of them went on to like pretty big things. Aziz Azari was the year before. I see. Um, won the award that I did. And so, but the, you just gave away the punchline. Uh, and, and I ended up, <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I, I ended up winning this award there at, uh, for best stand up comic. And the reason why uh, there's a couple things you were uh, the best. Uh, 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 there's a couple things <laughs> going on. One was that, um, that, I did different sets through the festival. So if any of the people evaluating this saw multiple oh, sets, that's great. I was the only one doing a completely different set each time. Versus everybody just doing their seven minutes. Their so seven their minutes. So we're not, it's like, okay, they have a good seven minutes. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, but is the John I, Mulaney's and, and those guys, they had already been seen. Because I was in Boston, because I was in a smaller market, Everyone had already seen John Mulaney. Everyone already knew John Mulaney was going to be a huge success and do really well. He was predicted to win this award at this festival. and But it was also like this festival's about discovering mm-hmm. a new person. And the agents and representation there are about discovering. He, I think he already had representation I at see. the time. And so that because I came out of nowhere, that allowed me to. Uh, so so that was I think in your book you talk about like going to the big city, going to where where the market is yes. for your for your business. And you're an and, exception and, to and that. My ex- and I'm an exception to that. Yeah, it's true. I still let you write that in the. No. <laughs> yeah. So so what what was your what was the Do you remember that section uh, about giving advice to people? Oh well, so one of the ideas. Um, I think this might be related to one of one of the we had some a few listener questions too, but I I mean what you've just sort of told the story of is well okay let so I, I finish up the book with some kind of career development type of advice and there's a one of the chapters is called take a bigger stage mm-hmm. and in it what I what I do is sort of map how comedians do what you just described you know they're sort of they're working on their craft. But um, what they're doing is they're they're looking for first the bigger place. That is that you're not going to get really get off the ground in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not other people who think like you. There's not opportunities to practice and so on. So you need to go to a bigger city, a place, a comedy city, of which there's only really a handful of them. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Boston, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. You know, maybe Atlanta. You know, I mean, there's a few, a few places, but, but really, New York and LA is are the, what everyone are the eventual of. goals because mm-hmm. that's where the epicenter of, of comedy is. And so, you know, I think that that one of the questions I think is important for regular people to ask is: given my career aspirations, am I living in the right place? Mm-hmm. Might I have to pick up and move and go somewhere else? If I want to, if I want to work in fashion, there's just a handful of places in the world that you can work in fashion and, mm-hmm. and really make it, you yeah. know, just, and of course that tends to be a big city, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, and the reason is, is that the big city provides that big city provides the people Mm-hmm. Right for those collisions, the people who become your future business partners, the people who become your business friends, mm-hmm. um, the inspiration that comes from interacting with folks who are at the leading edge of whatever it is that they're doing, mm-hmm. and that if you if you're living in Wichita, no offense to Wichita, by the time that stuff gets to you, it's too late, mm-hmm. you know, and like 
I mean, this goes so far if you think back, like you think about like French Impressionist painters, these folks all ended up being not only in the same city, but would go to the same cafes, mm-hmm. you know? So these were people who would paint in the morning and then go to the cafes and hang out with their frenemies, mm-hmm. you know, the people that they admired and liked, but also they were sort of competing with mm-hmm. to see who can make this new form of art better and better. And so I invite people to consider it's a big decision. It's difficult to do, but if, if you want opportunity, inspiration, it, you may need to pick up and move. I mean, certainly think, to get those networks. Absolutely. Th- think about it. I'm glad you, you finally made it to Boston. Mm-hmm. It would have benefited you to have left sooner. Sooner. Yeah. Right. That sooner. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm, um, you know, I'm, I live in a world of academia. It's a little bit different, but, you know, some of this is like going to a, a bigger university, you yeah. know, or going to a, you know, that kind of thing. So, so the second one is, to seek a bigger platform yeah and mm-hmm. so um this is really essentially is a is a scaling problem mm-hmm. and so as a touring comedian there are only so many people you can reach standing on a stage with a microphone mm-hmm. and so for example it's it's part of the reason i got so serious about my writing was while i was good at giving academic talks you know i can only talk to 20 people at once but when i wrote a paper I could reach thousands of people across the globe. Mm-hmm. And um, and I wanted to be able to do that just as well through written word as I could communicating verbally. And and so, you know, you think about like a career like a Steve Martin career, right? Steve Martin got so good at stand-up com- comedy that he was selling out arenas. Mm-hmm. Right? That That's extraordinary. Um, the arenas were so big, he took to wearing a white suit just so the people in the nosebleeds could see him on the stage. Yeah. You know? And then what did he do? He didn't just keep doing that for the next 20 years. First of all, that's very difficult to do in comedy because people are always seeking novelty. Now he's, you know, now he's he's going into television. He ends up on Saturday Night Live. Then he's in film, starring, writing, directing movies, and so on trying to get reach right so now you go from twenty thousand people in an arena to millions of people around the world mm-hmm. and today steve you know steve martin is still a recognized comedy brand mm-hmm. that's out there mm-hmm. and then the last one is and this one i think is probably the most important maybe it's it's sad that that it's one of the last lessons in the book and that's to take a bigger perspective and i you know i always say this um I, I I always encourage people to think bigger. And so one of the neat things about comics is that they say, they ask why a lot. Why? Right? To to create their comedy, they're constantly asking why, 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 why? Um, even about things that, that the average person takes for granted. But when it comes to their behavior, and especially when it comes to their career, they ask why not? Right? Like, you know, Shane says, why not me? Why, you know, why not? Why can't I be a comedian? Why can't I get on Conan? Why can't I do these things? And I have a special place in my heart for people who are making the most of their life. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're taking a shot. I know that it won't work out for many of them. I know that most business ventures fail, but the only ones that succeed are ones that get started. Mm-hmm. And even when you fail the first time or the second time or the third time, there's stuff to be learned for the fourth and fifth and sixth attempts Mm -hmm. in that way. And again, because it's not, you know, what's the saying is it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. Mm -hmm. That's certainly the case in comedy. I think that's the case in many things. The Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are the exception, Mm -hmm. not the rule. And so I think that understanding the path of a comedian in some ways can give people permission to try to approach their own career and think about their own life. Like, we need middle managers. I'm not I'm not disparaging them. But for someone to go, why not me? Why do I have to do this? Yeah. I think is a good way to it's a good question to ask yourself. Mhm. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking of uh th- this is related to sort of loosely related to a few of those things. 
But I was, I was thinking about, um, I was just through Austin again, where I lived for a couple of years, and mm-hmm. Austin was like the origins of of food trucks, which are now, you know, everywhere, and everyone's heard of food trucks, and even in my, uh, uh, you know, Wisconsin, uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin town, there's food trucks popping up and stuff. Well, what happened was in Austin, there was all these, like, great, you know, culinary chefs there, and it's like, well, what's success? Well, success is the amount of money you can make so how how do you make the most money as a chef well you work at the very fanciest steakhouse in Mm -hmm. town and then so these chefs would get this job and then they'd be like i'm flipping steaks right like this is not a use of my skills austin's an expensive city i can't i don't have enough money to start my own brick and mortar place Mm -hmm. and some clever person (laughs) like thought of i i mean it seems like this is innovation usually seems obvious after the fact fact, but i mean i i mean when everyone else is when you're like looking at like okay here's what food on the street looks like hot dogs or a funnel cake yeah that's it to someone to look at that and be like what if i made like a gourmet trailer yes. thing and it allowed me to innovate and be experimental and get the freshest ingredients each day and heck there's this place odd duck where the chef is this is a brick and mortar place now um but but he he would he would he would get in all of the freshest like basically reach out to the local farms be like hey dump off whatever the freshest stuff is I'll take whatever it is and cobble together a brand new menu every single day Mm -hmm. of like stuff you'd never heard of. I've never seen on any menu before things that you wouldn't think, but he just really knew what he was doing. So not only is he doing that with like cheaper ingredients, but they're better ingredients because there's stuff that like other restaurants aren't using because they're not a part of their standard menu. Yes. And, uh, and really standing out, you know, and, and now it is like a very successful brick and mortar place. They eventually were able to get the money and scaled up and, and everything else. But they, yeah, they, 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 what they did was, um, once they had established themselves, then they looked for a bigger platform, right? Mm -hmm. The, The thing, one of the cool things about that idea, I love that. I love that example of of food trucks is because one of the ways to I think the best businesses, the best business ideas and the best approach to business is limiting your downside risk. Mm-hmm. Right? So what you want to do is create a series of asymmetric bets. Mm-hmm. Right? So no one bet will ever ruin you and the culmination of your bets will never ruin you. But the upside is infinite Mm -hmm. and so the simplest version of an asymmetric bet is a comic testing a joke on stage Mm -hmm. right so you tell a joke for the first time on stage and it doesn't get any laughs no problem Mm -hmm. you know but what you're doing is you're paying attention did it get a little laugh did it get no laugh and then what you get to do is you get to tweak it Mm -hmm. and you try it again tweak it try it again is it improving it's not improving you just get rid of it on to the next joke Mm mm-hmm there's a chance, though, that you write the joke that makes your career. Mm-hmm. And there's a chance you fail in a way that you think of a correction for it that's actually applied to all of your Indeed. material. Yes. Something that you needed to do to get the attention of a super drunk, not paying attention crowd. So you just went on stage, screw this, I'm just going to do this ridiculous thing for attention that I would never normally do. Uh, I was actually just at, uh, I, I was at, um, uh, ju- this just happened okay. days ago. I go to Brendan Walsh's new show. Brendan Walsh is like this, uh, he, he's like mid forties and, and he's, he's just like a celebration of immaturity. He does podcasts where he's like making prank calls and stuff like that. He's a ridiculous human being and he's quite funny. And, um, and he, he has this new little show where it's like incorporating prank calls in stand up. So then he has like a host of show like I get on, do a five minute, ten minute thing, the audience gets to know me, and then I make a prank call with him. He has this thing all all worked out. And it was it, and there was this there was this party in there before the show that was like running late so he couldn't set up his stuff he's in a bad mood the party's like not leaving so it's a bunch of people that aren't there for the show and like no one's paying now the show's starting late and he's just like in the worst mood and he's like 
screw you know I, 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 rather than doing the regular intro thing of of like uh Oh, ladies and gentlemen, who's this? And then, like, explaining what the show is. Um, uh, he instead just sat down and he just makes a call. And, and the audience just starts hearing, like, a ringing uh-huh. through the speaker. And people just start paying a little bit of attention, you know? And then the person answers. And then he just starts in with this prank. It immediately grabs people's attention. And I didn't realize that uh, I was like, talking to him afterwards i was like do you always i was like what a great way to start the show it's a great fun way to start the show and he's like oh i've actually never tried that before i just did that because i was in uh, i was in this bad mood but because the room was a disaster because all these things were going wrong and he was like screw it Mm -hmm. i'm just gonna do this thing to grab people's attention he came up with what the show should be yeah that's how it should start every single time indeed <laughs> you know so there's just little examples like that constantly where you're putting yourself in a in a low cost you yeah, know low risk uh, situation low risk situation and so you know the the just to finish up this idea about these food trucks if the, if it's not obvious to the listener i hope it will be in a moment which is starting a food truck doesn't take that much capital yeah right so um worst case is you sell it to someone else who wants to start a food truck. Well, not only that, but you have a food truck you set up in this neighborhood, and you go like, "Hey, we got uh, we got frog legs, yes. a frog leg food truck." You know, here's a crazy idea. What if we only did frog legs and did them the best? And then it's like, doesn't work that well. Well, guess what? Try a little bit up. of paint on that food truck, move it to a different neighborhood. That's right. And, and now you're selling goat armpits <laughs> and, and right. seeing how that goes That's until exactly you stumble right. on the thing that works. Yes. So I, I always encourage people when they're thinking about starting a business, first of all, I don't think you have to go all in. You know what I mean? Like this doesn't have to be, oh my God, I'm going to quit my job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put all this on my credit cards and it's ride or die, (laughs) right? Yeah. Don't do that. You shouldn't do that. You should avoid ruin, right? You should avoid an orange jumpsuit by, you know, cheating and breaking the law and you should avoid losing your house and being homeless. But what a lot of comedians do is they, they have a job and then they, you know, they just hustling. You know, is it hard? Yes, of course. But anything worth doing is difficult. Not to mention that oftentimes, I, in my case of doing construction, I would often think of so much more material doing like labor. You know, I'm picking up garbage on a construction site and stuff like that. And my brain, just as a defense strategy, would would focus itself yeah. rather than this mundane task that crushes most people's souls at their yes. jobs. I had the free space to then think about my comedy, and now I had something to occupy my mind and to look forward to while I was doing the job that I hated. Mm-hmm. It was certainly better at doing the job that I hated with no prospects, with no, even if it's just a hobby, even if this is something that I go out on Wednesday nights and just crack up some friends and it's a social life or whatever. During my actual work day at the job that I didn't like, it even made that better. And then it also kind of made my comedy better because I was so determined to get the hell out of that job absolutely and then i had a little more of the resources to do it and then there was even things like collecting unemployment for a while when i got laid off of something that that you know allowed for me to have some income while i while i really set up shop and started doing some road gigs and stuff like that and then you have set your unemployment jokes also uh, yeah so, <laughs> this this came up I, I think in our last conversation is like when the market talks right so yeah. You know, when as a comic should you quit your day job? One of the one of the the signals is you're getting so much request for right. work that your day job is getting in job in the way of your night job. Uh-huh. You know, I mean that's a yeah. that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. So do you want to? So how do you want to do, I, I, some I, questions. Or how do you want to do this? Um, up to you. I mean, I I'd rather transition into how I'm doing what I what I do now because I think there's a lot of big bigger lessons in that potentially. Yeah, yeah. And then I mean, gosh, I have a zillion like practical business questions I'm still thinking about because I've then I've transitioned from being a comedian to now I'm like a show producer and like yes. even thinking like, geez, do I just start my own agency now that I've figured all this stuff out? Like a million comics could benefit from the things that I'm doing now that no one's serving them for. And like, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm smiling because I already that. like this idea. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, um, 
So, so then, uh, okay, I get, I get, I catch the breaks. I get on late night. Um, all I, all I ever wanted was a Comedy Central presents. You know, when I was a teenager, seeing like someone to have a half hour special. It was like I knew it was like the biggest people get in the hour. Like, okay, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not going to say I'll necessarily have an hour long special, but I love these half hour specials. If I just had one of those, man, that would, what a dream ended up getting that much faster than like was probably <laughs> even good for me. Um, in, in terms of like, uh, uh, dreams aren't what you're told when you're a kid. Uh, dreams aren't, aren't the never ending windfall of happiness and fulfillment, um, that, that you think. And, and the reason why that persists is because most people simply don't follow their dreams. So they never find this out. Yes. But, but, but the, the reason, the reason why they tell you to follow your dreams is one, they don't think you're going to, two, it takes a lot off of them, uh, rather than telling you like practical steps of mm-hmm. being successful. And, uh, and then also, I mean, you this is why, and it's people that actually haven't followed their own dreams. Otherwise, they'd be like, and after you complete your dream, then here's what you do. Yeah. No one ever says that. <laughs> no, There's no instruction manual for after you've accomplished you, your dream. You know, my version of this is, uh, my version of this is, you're the dog who who catches the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now what? Do you're I like, do? now what do I do with this thing? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now my teeth are around a car. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Um, and uh, so, so I, I, I remember. We might have our Instagram post right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember specifically. Um. I remember specifically that night I had my I had my Comedy Central um, presents. It went as good as I could have ever dreamed. You know, it was fan- for the style of comedy that I did at the time. I couldn't have done it any better for the restrictions that TV puts on you. You know, it was a, it was a very very good recording. That's great. And uh, you know, did it just completed my had this lovely you know had this after party people came for it was still the age when people didn't have kids and stuff still so they could travel all these high school friends and families they all came up reserved an area had a big after party afterwards celebrated and everything and i'm hanging out and it was like one of the most bittersweet moments of my entire life because it dawned on me oh shit <laughs> now i need to think how, of how old were new you things to do how 29 okay um, I, I had my actually i had mine um very recently I had to wait I had to wait to 40 <laughs> 49 yeah for mine which was getting full professor yeah 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 you know like you climb the mountain <laughs> I made it Prince, I incredibly made it. anticlimactic <laughs> it is. you get an email oh. you know you get an email that you're you've gotten full uh, yeah. professor and then you just go oh okay uh, hmm yeah 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 and, and, and then people are like what's it like well, <laughs> I don't want to ruin it for it. What's the view like up on here at the peak of Mount Nowhere? Yeah. Uh, well, it looks like there's a whole <laughs> lot of other peaks that kind of look a little nicer from my vantage <laughs> right. point. It looks like maybe I got to climb some more because I need to occupy myself. Yeah, I think that there is a little bit of a lesson in that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I talk about this in the book. I, I talk about um, Scott Adams has this saying, which is... Uh, don't have goals, have systems. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that I learned from you, it's not like this is your idea, but but just just the idea of- I have very few original ideas. Of, well, you present them as if they were yours. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, the idea of small incremental gains. And as I have learned about how the reward system works in the brain and the hedonic treadmill and everything else of, of like, you don't want to win the lottery. You're going to have one, two good years. And then it's- you're never going to top that again. It's nothing but downhill. Um, uh, whereas these small, you know, small incremental gains of like doing a little better this year than you were last year, doing a, getting, a, getting a little more, developing your skill a little bit more, making these advances, making these choices, advancing a little bit, maybe taking a few chances. You can withstand a couple dips or whatever. But you knock it out of the park and your dream comes through uh, at, 
at 29 and you've reached the top of that mountain and you're like, well, what the, cause then there's like nothing like, what do I do? Get on another one, like do it again, like get an hour special. That's what's the difference between that and a half hour special, you know, like, Ooh, I could perform theaters. I'm already performing. I already like what I'm doing. Like there was, I was really lost. It I was, see that. It, it, it was really, and that's, and that's why I, you know, I went into like, uh, um, the, you know, reassessing everything that I do at the same time I had been doing international stuff and I saw like a new medium, which was like, or, or a new way of doing comedy, which was like these people, there's like, they're doing all these festivals and these people do these one man shows, these solo shows. And they like really dig into a topic and do these themes. I was like, I've never done anything like that. You know, I do these short absurdist jokes and I was always pushing myself to like, I'm uncomfortable telling stories on stage. So I'll make myself tell stories mm -hmm. on stage i'm uncomfortable doing an act out or doing a character on stage so i'll make myself do that okay I'm uncomfortable singing i have a terrible singing voice i should be uncomfortable uh, here we but, go let's do this here song. We go. Yeah. and um and getting out of that comfort zone and wanting to travel internationally more sure um i was like well what would my theme be i was always reading science books and stuff i just it never even occurred to me to write jokes about science mm -hmm. it was just my hobby is what i did in my free time was like i i wasn't the biggest reader in the world but when i was reading i was only reading science books i was always watching you know when documentaries were then coming god i'm dating myself like documentaries are a, kind of a relatively new thing in terms of being as popular as they are and like the, the number of them coming they're certainly out. having a renaissance yeah, yeah and true. so then i'm like watching all you know i'm getting into animal planet stuff and whatnot and then all this this like coincides with my psychedelic use too which just makes you a little more introspective makes you appreciate nature a little bit more and and uh and i also didn't know how to present any of that in a way and so it's like well science is a way of talking about consciousness and perception and what is this life all about and what is the meaning of this existence how did we get here all these questions that i always wanted to address on stage had no idea how and now in a long term uh, in a uh long form you know solo thematic show now i could maybe really dig into something and and say something even if i thought it was like a little hokey that a lot of these one-man shows end up with like the dumbest like the end is like and that's why i don't eat graham crackers anymore <laughs> and it's funny and there's not a dry eye in the house and i knew i didn't want that i didn't want to be like overly sentimental about it or whatever some people do you know nanette was a very good special and some people make the most out of that um and um but I knew it was a possibility, and that's when I started kind of exploring the the science. Angle. You said, "Why not?" Yeah, why not? Why I'm not like, try it? I, I'm so like I'm kind of lost, and at the, in a very fortunate situation to be lost in, because I'm also now like a pretty well respected comedian yes. who's proven himself, who has credits under his belt, who's getting regular full time work, and the opportunity to take some chances which also made me lose a lot of work along the way and made people think differently about me and like i don't know if about this what's this science stuff sure. that he's doing all of a sudden you know and but i was i already had the uh i i i built on what i'd already built to then take chances and go a different direction yeah i have a couple reactions to this so one is um that what you had done was you had built these habits that allowed you to get good at what you do, but also to come to enjoy what you do, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about it, you know, most of a comic's day is not spent performing and making people laugh. Most of a comic's day is the craft of making jokes and writing and so on. And that, that can be, um, it, it, you know, it can be, it's challenging creative work. But as you get better and better at that, that can be a pleasing experience mm -hmm. and it can become something that that you're compelled to do um the other thing is it's like you love data right? yes. like whereas for most people that sounds like a nightmare for a lot of people the idea of if, if i told the average person like i need you to sit down and write a bunch of funny jokes right now that would sound like a nightmare it would too. be a nightmare too and these are just things that we've grown to like through developing this skill the first day that you try to do it it's it's hard to do mm -hmm. and then eventually it gets easier till you hit this sweet spot where your ability and the challenge match up and then you have the you have the opportunity to enter what's called a flow state mm 
mm-hmm. where time seems to evaporate and you have this sort of pleasing feeling to it. Mm-hmm. I in, in the book, I, I talk about having kind of a craftsperson approach to your work and that the craftsperson is not just, you know, turning a piece of, of metal into a sword and they feel good about having a sword, that the actual process of transforming that is enjoyable in of itself. Now, the thing that I want to point out, though, is in the epilogue of the book, I make the case against comedians, mm-hmm. right? So, so yes, we can learn from these sort of peculiar creatures, but we can't learn everything from them. And so uh, I present three ways that you shouldn't be like, Mm. comics and one and of that's them a, that's a generously short list <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough <laughs> well, i could have gone on, it could yeah, have gone on. Um, but one of them is being undifferentiated mm-hmm. and so in the world of comedy there's just a lot of people who i'll be honest you guys all look alike you all sound alike you know, I mean, there, I, I can't tell you the number of, of times that I have said someone say, you go to a show and then someone says, oh, that joke, that was really funny. And you don't even remember who told it, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, all comics, they all, they're, all their names seem the same. They all kind of all wear ironic T-shirts and mm-hmm. cargo pants. And, you know what I mean? There's there's this and and even the jokes start to sound the same, mm-hmm. so to speak. And, well, and comedians often know this too. At least the good ones are like hyper aware of like, oh, that's hacky, that's trite. Yes. That's been, you know, a lot of times we're texting our friends. Is it the good ones are usually like, hey, have you heard something like this before? Because I don't want to be redundant. Yes, uh, yeah. it seems familiar. And and so the world of of business rewards differentiated solutions. Mm-hmm. That is, I'm solving a problem in a unique way. Mm-hmm. This seems completely different. Now, when you are offering a solution that's completely different, now you're not competing on price, mm-hmm. for example. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm, I'm complimenting you by saying this because when everybody's going, I don't know about the science stuff. Mm-hmm. No one's doing it. Mm-hmm. To me, you know, there should be a red flashing light that yeah. says opportunity, yeah, opportunity, yeah. because – if no one's doing it, then there's a, there's a chance that that is going to to be really fresh and yeah. really different. Uh, and just wait until like I I do break through with it, or someone else breaks through doing like you know some sciencey stuff gets you know a TV show or yes. you know special that stands out or whatever. Within a week, every agent and manager in town is going to be sitting down with their clients like, "Do you have any science jokes that you can maybe work <laughs> in?" And like, they're just fucking morons yes. that are just trying to follow the trends they're usually like ages behind where where they are anyway so like try trying to read into it based on what they're doing is you know i i had my own my own version of this so your version was um hey and i'm reading all these science things maybe i could do something with it you were inspired by um you know this sort of uh scottish approach so to speak what is it called in um Edinburgh, yeah, yeah, Edinburgh, and Edinburgh kind of yeah. approach to doing French comedy, festival. right? That the the festival there, um, you know, my and and so what I say is like comics have an opportunity because first of all, they're seeking novelty in a way that almost no one else is, right? Because even if you tell a joke that's vaguely similar, you can get in trouble for that. Mm-hmm. Moreover, you can't keep telling the same jokes over and over again. So Coca-Cola has been selling Coca- the same bottle of Coca-Cola more or less for yeah. years. But you have to tell new jokes every few years. Yeah, there's not the, – the, the only thing out there that's anywhere close to like Freebird is like Jim Gaffigan's Hot Pocket joke yes, or something like right. that. You know, yes. yeah, where it's like, yeah, or like uh, who's on third or something like that. Uh, yeah, there, there's like – there's a handful of jokes ever that were like people are like I want to hear that again yes, and done that's in right. this way you know and so so to be paying attention for that novelty and then saying why not is an important mm-hmm. skill to have and, my mo- my moment yeah. was um, I was studying moral psychology mm-hmm. and I was giving I was giving an academic talk and I used an example of kind of an entertaining example of a moral violation. Mm-hmm. And my academic audience laughed. Yeah. And someone pointed out the incongruity 
between what I was saying, which is moral, moral violations upset people, and what was happening, which was this moral violation was delighting people. Mm-hmm. And they're like, why are we laughing? Mm-hmm. And I said, I have no idea. I had never considered what made things funny, even though I claimed to be an expert in emotions. It would have been very easy for me to just dismiss that. Mm-hmm. And instead, what I did was I came home and I go, you know, no one in my field is studying this. Mm-hmm. Not even not even that it was no one. I had never read a paper about this. I had never considered it. Mm-hmm. It, it was completely outside of the mainstream. And at first, people were like, you're going to study humor? You almost got laughed out of academia. Uh, hey, come on that's, now. <laughs> that's <was> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and um, but, you know, I, and so all I had to do was I have to work a little harder to write a paper about humor because I have to write a section about why humor is important. Right. But it's so easy to make the case for why it's important. Once people read it, it becomes self-evident. And then I had all this, what we call blue ocean to swim, you know, where no one else is doing the work and I'm able to make a case for it. It's important. It's understudied. It's a puzzling question and I have a good answer to it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and to be honest, like I, speaking of catching the, the car, mm-hmm. I'm in an interesting place academically because I'm not sure I can ever do anything that's going to be as big as that. Mm-hmm. Like, I think I've done my legacy inducing research mm-hmm. in my mid career. Mm-hmm. And so then the question is, well, do I try to top it? How do I top it? Or do I go, oh, do I move on to something else? Mm-hmm. It's an interesting, I haven't worked out that puzzle yet. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's going to be never ending. It certainly is, uh, for me. I, and, I, and we've talked about this before, but I also, at the exact same time, I, I mean, part of, part of why people might be listening and being like, well, why not then do an hour and then do theaters? And what I also noticed that, you know, at the time I was kind of getting away with doing it. You know, I, I developed early on by being able to get comics attention and by performing to the back of the room and doing these edgy things in a different way that was like absurd and like kind of ah shucks Midwesterny, like kind yes. of the Sarah Silverman approach or something like that. And, um, and at the time, there was only people like Sarah Silverman, who was nowhere near the name that she is now. And but but like there's when I started, uh, Daniel Tosh had just put out his first album, which is great. No one knew who he was. Mm-hmm. He didn't have Tosh point oh or anything. Uh, Bill Burr was completely unknown. I'd I'd never even heard of Bill Burr, and I was a comedy nerd. Um, Louis C.K. was just some unknown creep that like a couple comics knew about. Sure, um, you know. People knew about like say um, Carlin, and then comics knew about like Bill Hicks yes, or something indeed. like that. In, comics, in, comics. In terms of like pushing the boundaries and whatnot, but the field was relatively. Anthony Jeselnik got his breaks after uh, after me, so he was also unknown mm-hmm. at the time. So you're pointing Doug out Stanhope these... had 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 like burned every bridge. Like every every comic liked him, but too bad that's never going to work out for him. And then by the time I had caught my breaks. Now all of these people are getting known, yes. but also for getting known for like their boundary pushing yes, this at edgy. the same time where like, I'm like, well, they're doing it better than me and they have more experience than me doing it. They care more about doing it. And the, and the, now those spaces are filled. Now it's no longer the wide open ocean that mm-hmm. it was. People are already doing this. And at the exact same time, I was like, do I really care about like trying to make an edgier abortion joke or there's just like no end to it and it just started to feel lame it's like okay i got to say all the naughty words i always wanted to say when i was a kid and like i was feeling a little juvenile and um nothing against those you know i think those those guys were fantastic no 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 no, but the point is they're fantastic yeah the point is they're fantastic right like probably not gonna be better at it's hard to out anthony jeselnik anthony jeselnik right and uh, and so that was an, that was another thing of like, well, how do I differentiate myself in this market, which wasn't the kind of terms that I was using sure. at the time, but a sense of, you know, picking up on, on that I needed to be a little different at, at the same time, like, you know, t- sharing these bigger ideas uh, and talking about 
life and, and just like I started writing jokes with Animal Planet stuff and seeing these relationship parallels and stuff and I started venturing into this and then at the same time that I was like well maybe I'll do science stuff then I had to think about like well what does my science stuff what's that going to look like at first I was going to do like some silly thing about time travel and then I thought it more broadly it'd be a show about physics mm -hmm. and I'm glad that that didn't work out for me because I didn't mostly just because I didn't know how to write a one-man show at the time and I had to try out a few iterations of it but one of the things that I landed on with like the here we are podcast is like the subjects that I stay away from. I stay away from physics. Okay. And I stay away from like global warming because those are the two things that get the most press. Ah. If you are going to hear about science in the public, it's either like the big bang and space is really crazy and big and like Neil deGrasse Tyson uh -huh. stuff or global warming. Sure, You're going to want to, okay, everyone's very concerned about this global warming stuff. It's, I think both subjects are fantastic and interesting and everyone should learn more about them. But it doesn't differentiate what, what I'm doing yes. as much. And, uh, and my, also my interests changed uh, a little bit too. And so that was, a, that was a big part of, you know, that was by design that I planned out what exactly I was going to do too. And, and evolutionary psychology being a brand new field that most anyone hadn't heard of, I knew was blowing my mind when I was reading about it. Couldn't believe that I was just now hearing about this stuff in yes. my 30s and seeing an opportunity to sh make this funny, share it with uh, the mass in an interesting way that will hopefully change the way that they look at life the same as it's done for me. The nice thing about that approach, I mean, I love it obviously f for multiple reasons, but one of the, the neat things about what you do, and I've always liked this about your comedy, and I would say this off the air also, mm -hmm. is you learn something. Like mm -hmm. if you go to a Shane Moss comedy show, you get laughs, but you also learn something. Mm -hmm. So I... I've seen your, um, what I hope to soon be a special, a good trip. Yeah, at you know a, a couple times now live, and it's just an incredible show. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one is is super funny, but then the other one it, it's basically a crash course in psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Right, you give history lessons, you know, you you basically bring people up to speed. Um, I talk about the, what the experience itself is like. That's I right. give a few uh, helpful hints. Uh, yeah, if you want to try it, if... and so on. And yeah, it's just a great, um, it's just a great show. And so that has that kind of one-two punch of what I call "ha ha" and "aha." Mm -hmm. You know that that really comedians are are trying to get mm -hmm. right. They want comedy that changes, ideally changes the world at the very least, changes people's minds. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they want to do it while getting lots and lots of laughs. Mm -hmm. So I want to, um, I want to get to if you, if, in particular, if you have any sort of puzzles that you're kind of working on right now that we might be able to chat about. Yeah. But I want to give you a quick um, version, my own version of of the kind of stuff you're talking about, mm -hmm. and I'm going to relate it to some ideas in the book. So, um. And then I want to get your response about this. So I kick off the book with a lesson um, called Reverse It. And so the idea essentially is, is, is that comics are really good at producing an opposing perspective, creating misdirection, the switcheroo. Was, you talk, we talked about Anthony Jeselnik. He, he does this all the time you know, with, his, with his work. He takes people one way and then brings them back completely in, in the opposite direction. And my argument is that, that thinking in reverse – is useful for comedy, but it's useful for a whole variety of things, especially when it comes to business, whether it be small questions like, how do we lower costs? I invite you to think about how that you might raise costs and what might be the benefits of that, of that idea. And then one of the ideas in the book that follows this, um, the reversal is kind of a step out of the stream approach. It's just a very different way to think about the world, um, is the value of authenticity and like and just being really honest and being yourself in the world versus trying to be what you think people want you to be and i always i always quote you when i when um as you're like my role model for authenticity which is um you like to say when you find yourself scared or concerned about talking about something you force yourself to talk about it on stage 
right? As you were saying earlier before, um, I think that's, that's a great way to create comedy, but it's also a great way to be differentiated in the world because most people are so carefully trying to cultivate their brand that it's refreshing to see someone being themselves and owning it and being unapologetic mm-hmm. about it. I mean, I was raised in an environment where people just care so deeply about what everyone else thinks all yes. of the time. It's like, well, how are they coming up with their own? They're all just doing the same thing, and then they're just nervously worrying about what you think about them, and like no one even knows what we're evaluating here. Like, yes, it's it's just like a, a bunch of hard work for nothing. Yes. Uh, um, and then the the last idea is this idea that a lot of jokes come from um, like a kernel, something that you think is funny, yeah. right? So most comics jokes don't come from, oh, the audience is going to love this. Yeah. It's something they're kind of snickering about. They find kind of peculiar. And then so they put it out there as the joke that they find funny. And then what they do is they say, do other people find it funny? How much? Mm-hmm. Can I make it funnier? You know, can mm-hmm. I pivot, you know, adjust it and so on. So I have... Um, these three ideas of the reversal authenticity and what I call an audience of one, right? So if you, if you create something that solves a problem for you, um, good news, you've just solved the problem for you. Better news. If in a world of, of nearly 8 billion people, there might be a lot of people like you who you can solve a problem in a novel way. And so to that end and influenced in part by these ideas, I've, you know, I've launched this other podcast, Mm -hmm. right? Called Solo, Mm -hmm. The Single Person's Guide to a Remarkable Life. Well, let's pick it through. Which you were nervous about, which you you had concerns about. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, 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 I mean, which also made you think more critically about how you wanted to present it and do a little more trial and error before you launched it in the first place. That's right. I actually pivoted it a little bit. So you think about it. Solo is a reversal, right? Mm -hmm. In a world where everybody seemingly is getting married and all the pressure is to get married. I love the, not, uh, I I don't know how much time we have, but but I love, I love the ski slope example when, uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. Oh, I'll tell that story. Yeah. You want to tell the story? Yeah. It's really relevant to what we're talking. Sure. Sure. We'll take a, a digress here for a moment. Um, so, uh, Snowbird is a Utah um, ski, uh, ski area, and it's it's known for being a challenging ski area. You know, eleven thousand foot peaks, you know, um, steep downhills, and so on. And the the people who run Snowbird are they're you know they're competent individuals. They pay attention to what their customers are saying. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they started to notice was they were getting a bunch of one star reviews often from people in like California or New York saying things like, you know, there's too much powder and, uh, too many trees. there's too many trees and these tree wells and it's just not fun. You know, it's too hard, it's too hard. And so if you think about it, if you're, if you're, you're like, Oh my goodness, well, this might be a problem. Well, I guess we could we could do more grooming, and then let's in the off season, of these trees. cut let's down some the of these powder. trees, yeah. and we could we could have more green runs. Like, let's open this new run called Baby's Bottom, you know, and just customers always right. The customer is always right, exactly. Well, or you could say, well, we don't want to do that because we have these hardcore skiers who seek us out because we have some of the best powder in the world, mm-hmm. and because we have these tree wells are challenging and so on. So we could ignore Greg from Los Angeles and his one-star review. Or you could go even further. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing a comic would do. Mm -hmm. They ran what ended up becoming an award-winning ad campaign where they showed people the the one-star reviews as a way to say, if you want something easy, take your weak shit elsewhere. Yeah, And if you want something hard, we're the place for you. And so what they they did was they were very clear about who their customer yeah, was yeah. and and not trying to create a, a mountain for everyone. Yeah, they they create a mountain for hardcore skiers. Yeah. And now you have a reason to choose them and you have a reason to not choose them. Yeah, I call this to, they create a chasm. Mm. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So a solo. Oh, with solo. Yeah. So solo has a little bit of that kind of chasm creating. Like it's it's made to be a. It's not a podcast for everyone. It's 
it's a podcast for the unapologetically unattached for that person who's single for now or forever thinks of it as a positive thing yet when you make that decision you don't have anyone to talk to about it you're the thanksgiving conversations with the family are just annoying they're asking you when you're gonna settle down and when you're gonna make your life the same nightmare theirs is so (laughs) they can all be in this torture for to get together and it it can be really isolating this will actually transition into some of my psychedelic stuff quite well too is a similar thing and and so this is a podcast for for people that that want you know every every dating tip out there is about how to find the one and yes. like child rearing stuff and all of that. And why not have dating tips or about how to have a good date? Yeah. You know. And so um solo's a reversal, mm-hmm. right? So it's about, you know, in a world where everybody's getting pushed to marriage, it's a it's an alternative to that 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 not being married has its own set of benefits and opportunities. Bless you. Thank you. Two is it's a really, it's revealing my most authentic self because Mm -hmm. my bachelorhood was never in the public. Mm -hmm. It was always in private. It was never front stage. It was always backstage. And so I've had to reveal parts about my life that I never would have before. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that people are really enjoying and appreciating Mm -hmm. because you know think about it if there's always one solo person at thanksgiving across 100 different thanksgiving there's a hundred people but there's no place for them to talk yeah or to find out about each other Uh, yeah this is exactly what i found out with my psychedelic stuff which i had had so many psychedelic jokes for a long time and then when the idea of doing themed shows you know i did a couple themed shows before my psychedelic show well i i had I mean, Psychedelics would have been the first show probably that I would have put together had it been like up to me in, in the sense that had it been, had it been, had I thought there was a market for it. As far as I knew, like I'm not, I wasn't at the time involved in any psychedelic communities. I didn't know about the psychedelic research going on. As far as I knew, I, you know, mushrooms were a thing that I did like usually by myself or with a small group of friends. Yes. I didn't. I didn't you know, rather taboo thing. I couldn't imagine myself doing it in a club. Fortunately, one of the few bits of good advice representations ever given me was an agent was just like, well, let's just find a small, I mean, I think that might be interesting. Let's just find a small, like little indie venue or something and see if 50 people will show up. And they did most enthusiastic crowd I've ever that's, seen. That I think that's the key thing is again, if you, you know, I want to keep relating this stuff back to the listeners who might be thinking about trying to take their career to the next yeah. level. And the idea is, if it seems strange, if it seems peculiar, but it feels really important for you, it's worth trying because it means that there's there's a chance that there's other people like you and they're not being served. Yeah. You know, and so, and believe me, when I was just doing regular old stand up and like doing jokes about my girlfriend or like a weird time travel joke or something like that, and like, oh, here's a wacky thing about being from Wisconsin, um, no one was coming up to me afterwards being like, thank you yeah. so much uh-huh. for what you do. This is very important, you know. And, the market is speaking. And, absolutely. And and then that took off for me. And then, the, and, and then I did this 111 city tour as I kind of figured out. That's why I had to start taking the business side of things and marketing. Okay, now I can find these smaller, but now I need to fill it myself. Mm-hmm. I can't depend on the comedy club to do that. So I had to learn uh, a, a lot of business techniques, which, you know, we don't have time to get into all of it but but we um but i you know i got i got it figured out did this whole indie tour and then afterwards i went back to comedy clubs doing regular stand-up again i was like oh i actually don't like this anymore (laughs) i like this indie thing where i'm drawing an audience that knows what they're getting knows it's not going to be a regular show knows there's going to be a little more intelligent content knows that it doesn't need to be as like punchline heavy there's it's a little more of a one-man show there it's a little more ted talky it's a little more Mm -hmm. personal and storytelling and that sort of thing how do i do that and then i one day and this is you know i'd now been doing the here we are podcast for four years or whatever and and uh really felt like oh this indie market is the way to go and i was thinking about like you know i can't there's reasons why it's hard for me to do a live here we are podcast because for 
I don't have quite enough listeners to get a reliable audience in Timbuktu. Right. And then and then if I advertise, there might be people that are interested in in science and comedy being put together, but but then it's like if if there's not the name rec- recognition, the title here we are doesn't say anything. And then also like okay, they find out what it is. Well, if they don't read this if if, if they don't listen to this podcast, mm-hmm. is this relevant to to them is this going to make sense for them and uh and one day i was like what do i want to do i want to stand up on stage and some i don't want to have to do punchlines all the time sometimes i just want to talk about uh science right and i was like oh i want to stand up and do science and i thought i have stand up science yes. and i was like oh and then i can be joined by professors i'll just have them give talks as well figured that out and then there's been a million uh, lessons that i had to figure out along the way and if i could for a second yeah like i think what we're you know it's funny because we're talking you and i are both talking about these sort of side projects that are starting to become more and more prominent in our lives and their origins are rather the same you know which is thinking differently about the world moving into a place that seems a little bit uncomfortable um, and really doing something that comes from you and then finding out that there are other people who are sort of feeling underserved. Mm-hmm. I, by the way, I'm getting the same reactions to solo. I've never had so many people email me, call me, text me, send me private messages saying, this is great. Thank you so mm-hmm. much, which suggests that we're on to something mm-hmm. now. Um, I mean, I mean, one thing I think a mistake that a lot of people make is going going back and re, uh, uh, revisiting a couple of things as as we sum up kind of what we talked about here. Sure, is that uh, you know a lot of people when they're like, "What should I do with my life, with my career?" They're like, "Okay, well, what do people do?" Yeah, and they're getting their ideas from like, "Oh, I need a job." So I'll look up what jobs are out there available because that is what the realm of possibilities is for me rather than creating, you know, uh, creating your own uh, niche and and being like following what you authentically want to do. Like, well, no one out here, uh, no comedian does stuff about psychedelics. There's not a market for that. Uh, Everyone says marriage and kids is the thing. So I'm not going to go against the the mainstream if i'm gonna write a relationship thing i'm i'm just gonna do another new way of how (laughs) how to make monogamy work because that's what sells yeah so i think i think when someone critiques your idea that says no one is doing that they might be right because no one wants it yeah but they might be wrong because no one is doing it but the world wants that thing Mm. And so I think those things are worth a shot, as I say, to reiterate this point, but treat it like a joke. That is, you're limiting your downside risk, you know? And so if this podcast doesn't work out, I lose, a, you know, I, I lose some thousands of dollars, but not tens of thousands of dollars. If your indie venue psychedelic show didn't work out, you lost some time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, and a little bit of an investment, some advertising, exactly, money or something right. Like that. But the upside is is huge, right? Because what does what does the psychedelic work turn into potentially? It's got me on all these big podcasts, exactly. made a zillion new friends. I'm in this community and now. I'm you I get, get work asked out of it to do all yes. of these uh, different conferences and stuff. I get to meet the finest people I've ever met in life. I get to meet more people like myself uh, and uh, and. Fossil free drugs all of the time. So follow your dreams. You might get free drugs, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Pete hates when I try to end things with a joke. Oh, it's uh, um, but the, the the point is, is being it. You know, the, the the point is, is if I were instead being like, ooh, I see this hook going out there. Like oh, Shane Moss is doing a psychedelic show. Maybe I, I can do a psychedelic show too. Too late. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't work like find that. Find your own thing. You, you got to find your own thing. And, and, and if you are going to do something like that, you know, I'm never going to start a restaurant. But all of the time, because I travel and I love going out to eat and I I have particular things that I really like. And when I see something new and different, I'm often like, man, if I just took that idea and brought it back to 
lacrosse wisconsin or whatever where i'm from that's just like you know a little bit maybe 10 years behind where where like um you, you know austin's at or yes. something like that you know there's a and then make my own changes and wisconsin it up a little bit add a little throw a little more cheese on there and and, <laughs> and that that idea um could work but that there again it's because it's a it will be a novel thing in that area yes that's right okay we're we're not going to end this with a nice little tidy bow on it. Yeah, who cares? So that's fine. I've never had a tidy bow on anything. You're a tidy bow kind of a guy. I am a little bit. That's yeah, fine. I can handle it. Uh, to listeners, thank you uh, for listening. I hope this has proved to be a, like a little bit of inspiration, and there's a few new ideas that you walked away from, walked away from, listened away from that, uh, that you didn't have to begin with. Walked away with. Walked away with. Um, and, and, and I mean, the, part of the reason why there's not such a tidy bow on here is because this is, as you can hear, a longer than normal podcast. I didn't even get to half of the stuff. I didn't even get to the stuff that I'm doing now. It's because Pete and I, we could do a whole nother episode about all of this stuff. And there's just so much interesting um, content that you can learn from this book. So if you want to, if you want to put a nice little bow on things, uh, the book Stick to Business has a nice little bow, and you can get all of these lessons and more and a ton of fun business examples like we've been sharing. And to check that out. It's my first time contributing to a book. It's Pete's second book, mm-hmm. and uh, it was really inspiring and fun and cool, and I think people are really going to dig it. Actually, this is, no, people, it was released yesterday, and people have but it exploded everywhere. <laughs> the, the world broke open and uh so you've already heard of it so this is old news but get out there and and check it out i'll have some for sale at my live shows i'll sign them for you and everything else and uh yeah uh, i really appreciate having such a wonderful audience of such uh curious and interesting people so thank you all for listening thanks so much cheers Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit PeterMcGraw.org for more information about our guest, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this...